Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Louise, if you're going first, do you want to go ahead and um, put up your slides? Sure. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm Chief Knowledge Bro Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased to welcome all of you here today. Uh, today's webinar is um, Groundbreaking New Approach to Tsunami Detection and Warning. We're very pleased to have Louise Comfort um, mm -hmm. from the University of Pittsburgh and Lee Freitag from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute here to present to us about a new book that um, they've published uh, called Hazardous Seas about this work. Um, before we go ahead and turn it over to Louise and Lee, we wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. So we'll have a formal presentation first, and then we will, um, we'll, then we'll be open for questions. Um, if you want to send it, you can send in questions at any point during the webinar. That's fine. And you can send them in by posting them in the question panel of the user interface. And we walk, that, that's perfect for questions. Um, and then in the chat, um, you are able to chat with everyone. We, you can post questions there if you want, also want input from other attendees on the webinar. Or if you have additional information that would be useful for the webinar, feel free to post it in the chat. We just ask that you keep anything you post to everyone in the chat professional. Um, thank you very much ever, to everyone who was able to make it, and th thank you very much to all of you who are here at odd hours in the middle of the night, so our early morning. We appreciate you making uh, the effort to be here. Um, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Louise and Lee now. Well, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. Uh, we're really delighted to have this opportunity to uh, share some of the findings from our book. And I first want to begin by thanking <clears throat> our international interdisciplinary team. This was a major effort. We absolutely could not have done it without our colleagues in Indonesia. And I will have to say it's 1 a.m. in Indonesia now, so they may not be watching, but I do want to acknowledge Hakunti Wahayo, Lee Kaitog, <clears throat> who you see here and will be talking later. Also, Tayyip Sanadi, University of Pittsburgh, Emil Okal, our seismologist. Tayyip was a computer scientist. Uh, Emil Okal, our seismologist from Northwestern University. Febren Ismail from Andalas University, key person. And our three Indonesian engineers, uh, Ian Turiano, Wahyu Pandoi, and Zarandi. Uh, they were all. Um, practicing engineers with BPPT, which was the National Indonesian Agency responsible for managing the buoy system in Indonesia. That agency has now been reorganized under a national agency for research and innovation, and all three are affiliated with that new agency. But we also included other researchers from the University of Pittsburgh Bandung Institute of Technology, Woods Hole, Northwestern University, and uh, Universitas Andalas. Mm -hmm. So this is the book, As It Is Seas. And in this book, we tried to address this complex problem of early warning, uh, early tsunami uh, detection and warning. And as you know, tsunamis are generated by undersea seismic activity earthquakes, landslides, volcanic eruption, or major displacement of the water. The real question is, why is it so difficult? And the difficulty is because the near-field tsunamis occur less than 200 miles from shore. And our current de detection methods, which are largely the uh, DARPA, uh, the deep ocean, um, uh, tsunami buoys um, miss the near shore tsunamis. They're very good at detecting the deep ocean, but they miss the near shore tsunamis. And there is high uncertainty about when these tsunamis will occur and where they occur. 
Um, and when they do occur, there's high urgency for a response. There's less than 20 to 30 minutes of, from the time the uh, earthquake or displacement occurs and the wave uh, strikes shore. <clears throat> so the other major reason for doing the study, undertaking the study, is that tsunamis create the potential for massive harm, not just a little harm, but massive harm. And this study actually originated after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami uh, that occurred on the 26th of December 2004, a magnitude nine rupture of the Sunda Trench, and it generated massive waves that went throughout the Indian Ocean Basin. Indonesia was most heavily affected, approximately 125,000 lives were lost, but there was heavy destruction in other Asian countries, Sri Lanka, Thailand, India, and across the ocean to East Africa, approximately 250 lives lost in all. And 2004 was not a one-off event. Seven years later, well, actually 2004, five years later, there was another earthquake in Padang in 2009 and another massive earthquake seven years later in 2011 in Tohoku, Japan. And in Japan, there were three destructive waves, one of which damaged the Fukushima um, nuclear power plant, which released radioactive pollution into the sea, into the air, into the land. And in fact, just 10 days ago, there was a small tsunami in Japan on Noto Island. So tsunamis represent complex dynamic systems that involve sea, ocean, land, <laughs> and electronics. Uh, they, this compels an interdisciplinary approach and this was the rationale for the Hazard Seas Research Project that was funded by the National Science Foundation uh, for five years, 2013 through 2018. And this project included researchers from six institutions, four in the US, two in Indonesia. Uh, and the uh, researchers included computer scientists, um, ocean engineers, structural engineers, land use planners, uh, public policy personnel, people who had been involved in uh, focusing on decision-making in uncertain conditions uh, for years. And the effort was to integrate the science of the undersea seismic movement with novel engineering technologies and pair it with social science-informed neighborhood networks and public education to communicate timely warning to coastal communities at risk so these communities could actually evacuate themselves and reach high ground. And this is the, uh, a format of the Indonesian official tsunami warning system. And you see the across the top bar, BPPT was the Indonesian agency. Uh, responsible for the buoys. Then there's BMKG, which is a scientific agency that determines whether it is actually a tsunami. And then there is BIG, which is the Indonesian uh, um, and GIS system. It's mapping system for the whole country. What's interesting about the system is that there is both an upstream and a downstream component. And the upstream is the detection of the tsunami, and the downstream is the communication of that tsunami to the uh, provinces and the communities that would be actually be affected by the tsunami. And you see in red here a missing link, and that is the local connection between the um, provincial government and the city government and the neighborhoods, and this was the area that we were working on specifically for the neighborhood tsunamis. <laughs> so this interdisciplinary approach integrates the science of undersea seismic movement into a model of tsunami detection. And Emil Ocal, our seismologist at Northwestern University, 
identified two types of undersea tsunamis, one called the treble cliff, or Emil called it, treble cliff earthquakes, which were short, sharp, seismic movements that did not generate tsunamis. And the second are base cleft earthquakes, or long, deep, rolling seismic movements that lead to tsunamis. And the challenge, the scientific challenge, is to distinguish the two types of undersea movement to determine the actual threat of a tsunami. How do we do this? Well, one way is through ocean engineering, and we will give more details about that. But ocean engineering provides the tools and the measurement and transmission of data to assess and validate undersea movement in the water column to determine if a, water, uh, if a tsunami is underway. And it's this communication of timely data over a network of electronic devices to provide timely warning to communities at risk. And then we add to that the people. And this is through social science modeling where we use wireless networks for local communication and smartphones among the people but supported by public education to create an informed community that is able to use updated technologies to communicate with one another this sudden risk and to evacuate the area under threat. And this is to enable self-organization at the neighborhood level. That's always been the hardest place to go and to create a culture of sustainable risk reduction and community resilience to hazards. Now, our social science approach seeks to align knowledge and action across these jurisdictional scales of operation. And community engagement involving the people in the communities is absolutely fundamental to inform action. And we wanted to use advances in information and communication technologies to overcome gaps in risk awareness and to activate neighborhoods to take timely action to avoid risk. And this is a design, and we'll go through it in detail, but it shows how this community resilience framework connects with a database service at the local level, uses small board, uh, single board computers to create a wireless network that is not dependent on electricity. So it's functioning in a disaster degraded environment. It connects to the Iridium satellite. And then that connects to smartphones, which the residents of the community use to communicate with one another. Now, doing this project, it literally took nine years. And there were many challenges that were encountered and that had to be overcome. And, uh, you know, we acknowledge that international interdisciplinary research is not easy, but there were multiple challenges that had to be met. And this remarkable team met these challenges with discipline, persistence, and goodwill. Funding was important. The initial first grant from the U.S. Uh, uh, National Science Foundation started the project. And as the project encountered difficulties, we received very welcome and generous support from the Swiss Reef Foundation in Zurich, Switzerland. And a last and final grant was critical uh, to the final deployment from the YADV Foundation. And then of course, we had continuing support from our own research institutions University of Pittsburgh, Bandung Institute of Technology, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Andalus University, Northwestern University, and very importantly, BPPT Indonesia. Working conditions, very difficult. Two languages, communication across 12, 16 time zones, 24 hour flights, innumerable Zoom calls, and what WhatsApp notes at all hours of the day and night. But the final difficulty, and this was maybe the most difficult, was COVID-19. 
and the unanticipated restrictions on international travel that caused uh, caused by the pandemic delayed the completion of the final installation of the NDC network for two years. The prototype was completed, but tested in stages rather than as a single operational unit. And now I'll turn the the um, the cloud over to Lee. Lee. Eloise, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen and I can begin to uh, show the, uh, the rest of the story, which is the, um, uh, the deployment and uh, operation of the system. Okay. Can you see my screen okay, Louise? Yes, it's fine, it's clear. Great, okay. So first of all, just like uh, Louise, I wanna thank all the folks who helped us uh, in the field, in particular, the VPPT engineering team, Ian and Zarandi, who may be online today and watching, and uh, Fairburn Ismail, professor at the University of Andalus, who was instrumental in providing the local support that we needed, including bonding the, the ship that we were able to use to do the initial deployment and the initial testing was really, really key. But along the way, there were literally dozens of other people who were, were uh, able to support us, uh, everybody from the local taxi drivers to the team which helped with the initial deployment, and also the technicians and the other engineers uh, who worked at the VPPT. So I wanted to thank them and acknowledge the fact that this is not, not simply a US, a U.S. project, even though a lot of the initial funding came from the National Science Foundation. Uh, large amounts of funding were supplied uh, in Indonesia by the Indonesian government across all these different organizations, and that was really key to the success. So going back to uh, the whole problem here, we have a very short amount of time from when there is an earthquake uh, that is uh, ruptures an area close to shore to when a tsunami event will result in a wave that can affect the local population. And it's this very short amount of time that we want to begin to, uh, to look at in terms of enhancing our, our early, warning, early warning systems. Uh, in Indonesia, after the the, uh, the 2004 tsunami, a number of areas were identified as, as being uh, prime uh, 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 sources of uh, earthquake th earthquake th threats. And we, we picked uh, from these different threats uh, the, the near field and focused in on an area in Sumatra, which um, was uh, the, the, uh, uh, the point of a 2009 earthquake, which reinforced the, um, the, the danger that the area is actually in. There's a large amount of energy, which is pent up in this area and it has not been released despite the earthquakes that happened in 2004 and 2006 and also in 2009. So this is the area of focus because it's an area of immediate need and maybe it's not not uh, next year or the year after but within the next few decades there is no doubt going to be a very very large earthquake which uh, we may need to uh, be pre better prepared for with a, a warning system. So you might ask, well, uh, why not just use the deep ocean dart buoys, which were were developed uh, just for for, um, for just for this kind of purpose? Well, those those buoys were originally developed for use offshore, and when they were brought closer to shore in Indonesia, many of them were vandalized. They're relatively close to shore; they're easy to find. Uh, they they serve as places where fish tend to aggregate, and so they attract uh, attract fishermen. And so sometimes they're tied up to, and, and they get vandalized. So if the buoys aren't uh, aren't, aren't um, a good a good way to uh, have a warning system. What can we do? Well, one way is to simply put all of the sensors on cables and run the, those cables ashore. However, th those costs are, are very high, and there's a maintenance cost as, as well. But once they're once they're installed. We had this idea collectively that if we could use acoustic communications, uh, then we could extend the length of these uh, these cables um, and go further offshore to provide an additional warning time. Further, the short cables have a, a lot of advantages. They're not only lower cost, but they're actually easier to deploy because they don't have to be as heavy. And <clears throat> the uh, electrical systems that are are used with these cables are not as elaborate as the cables which stretch for many tens or <clears throat> hundreds or, <clears throat> or even thousands of, of, of kilometers. So our objective was to uh, avoid the buoys and see if we could have a hybrid approach instead. So this is a just a, a basic overview of the system. You can see the um, uh, the Mentawi Basin is the, the body of water in the center. Uh, the Subaru Island is uh, part of the, the Mentawi group, and Padang is the population center, which is which is at risk. Uh, 
the um, system was was set up so that there would be a, a bottom lander, which is a sensor uh, that would be on the bottom of the ocean, and it would do the detection, send the, the signal back to shore in Subaru, and then that would uh, trigger the the Indonesian tsunami early warning system, the existing system that uh, Louise just mentioned, and then the, those warnings would go out to the public uh, um, in the, the same way that other warnings are, genera are generated at, at the moment. The way that we approached the project was in, in three phases. One was in 2016, uh, where we were um, where we were funded to go and do a test um, in, in situ to go and uh, to check both the acoustics and the sensor systems. And then in 2020, we went back and uh, and deployed uh, what we thought would be the final system. It turned out to be just a prototype check, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, more recently, just in 2022, uh, we went back and recovered the um, the system, which is out in, in deep water, and then. Uh, change the batteries and put it back in again. And I have, have a few uh, videos to show about that. You can see some of the working conditions and, and uh, get a better sense of the systems and, and how, how they worked. So let me go back to what really is the enabling physical phenomena for, for the, the system. It, it goes back to the basic fact that, that uh, sound travels in, in, in water relative to its speed. And, and that speed changes with the temperature and it also changes with pressure. In Indonesia and, and other parts of, uh, of, of the world, there's a layer of warm water uh, at the surface. And if we have uh, acoustic signal, um, an acoustic modem in this case, and we send that signal from the seafloor, the sound then travels towards the surface, but then it bends or refracts away from the surface and then travels back down to the, to the, um, the uh, seafloor again. And so in this way, um, we, we can send sound over longer distance because we can just take advantage of the fact that the sound is uh, is, is refracting, which uh, causes very little loss rather than re reflecting. And so this is the, the main enabler uh, for the acoustic system. And the uh, 25 kilometers is simply based on selection of a frequency and the, the, the power level. And it's sort of a practical maximum for the system as we envision at the moment. But this is the basis for why, why, why this will work. In 2016, after doing a modeling and system design, we, we took uh, hardware to Indonesia, worked with, with, uh, with Ian and his team uh, from the BPPT um, and Fairbrand, who was able to, uh, to get the ship for us. Um, and we did a successful experiment uh, where we um, put a, a uh, underwater lander with the pressure sensor out in, in the, the middle of the Mentawi Basin, about halfway bet between the island of Subrut and, and Padang. And, uh, collected a bunch of acoustic data. We also collected pressure data, which was, was later analyzed uh, to look at the earthquakes that, that occurred over, over time. And then uh, began to think about how we could um, set up the final system for deployment so that we, we could go further uh, with our proof of concept. So we identified an area relatively close to shore, uh, about seven kilometers, where the cable might be able to, to, be, to be deployed. The VPPT had already surveyed the, the area with one of its research specialists, so we knew that it would be possible to, uh, to put the, the cable in, in this area. And so we focused in um, on these locations for, for transmitters and receivers for the acoustic system, and we, we proved that both w w would be um, w would be functional. So both the acoustic system, um, the acoustic com communications over the 25 kilometers, and also the operation of this pressure sensor, very press, very sensitive pressure sensor down at at the bottom of the ocean uh, using th this lander. You will know, just take a second to explain <clears throat> what this is. We have um, uh, glass floats, which are inside of these inside of, the, of, the, of these balls. The glass floats provide flotation. The pressure sensor is down here on, on the, the bottom, and then there is a, a weight, um, and the, the weight can be dropped upon an acoustic command that comes from the surface. So, so we, we drop this in the in, in the ocean. It settles to the bottom, and then in this case, it just sat there collecting. Uh, a data in 2016 for our test deployment. And when we want to recover it, then we send an acoustic command uh, to this device here called an acoustic release. And it, it turns a little mechanical crank and then it drops the weight and then this, this comes back to the surface. This is how um, ocean engineers um, deploy and then recover the sensors on the, on the, the sea floor. And not all of you have uh, seen those. So I just wanted to make sure that that was, that that was clear. 
So um, we completed the, the design of the system uh, between 2017 and, and 2020. So here's our lander at the, uh, at the, the, the bottom. Acoustic communication systems was in a pressure housing uh, here above it. And then we have some floats which will allow us to recover the, the system. Uh, we want to change the, the batteries. So really important that the pressure sensor is on the, the seafloor um, so that it's, uh, it's coupled to the seafloor and doesn't have any motion which could be imparted by the currents which might be in the area. And then we want the acoustic communication system to be above the seafloor. So it's located here um, about 10 meters above it. So this is the design of the remote sensor. There's uh, a little microprocessor that uh, is looking at the pressure data as it, it, it comes in here. And I'll talk about that just a little more in, in, a, in a second. This is an example of the <clears throat> of the, the data that is observed by the pressure sensor if there's an earthquake nearby. Um, in this case, uh, there is a strong signal, which is imparted by the acceleration, and that's also measured by the pressure sensor. We had two um, separate uh, goals for the system to be able to operate autonomously. One, we needed to know that it was actually functional, and so um, every every 12 hours or twice a day, we scheduled the system uh, to send back a little bit of information that would show that the sensor is operational, and also to report um, if any of these small ev events were present so that, that the, um, the action of the sensor can be calibrated against events that were recorded on shore for, from other seismometers. But most importantly, the, uh, the function of the, the sensor and the, the detection system is, is to look at the, 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 the level of the pressure sensor, and then when it exceeds a certain threshold, to immediately report that, that back to shore over the acoustic modem. And so we, we built this functionality into the sensor system and uh, programmed it programmed it such that the alerts would go on for about 10 minutes if that threshold was exceeded. This is the basic operation of, of the detector. So here's a complete look at the, the system going here from the bottom right up and then to the left. Uh, the, the bottom lander has the, the detector on it, looking at the sensor, working at a very low power and processing each sample as it comes in in real time, um, twice a day. And then also if there's an event, um, the uh, messages are sent over the acoustic modem over that 25 kilometers with, uh, through the, the, the water. And then that's received uh, here at the cable end unit where there's another acoustic modem. It's very similar, except it gets its, its power from shore and has a fiber optic cable that uh, that then has a direct uh, link to the shore station where the um, signals that then go over an iridium link. They could also go through a, lo a local network, but uh, that might not be operational if, uh, if there's an earthquake and there's no power. So we have an, a... Um, a iridium system that the BPPT programmed can be able to take those signals and then send them back in, into, into their uh, normal data processing system. And then that, that goes into the Indonesian, Indonesian tsunami or early warning system. So this is the complete data flow. So in 2020, we, uh, we all worked together to, um, to, to do this deployment. So here's, here's the lander being moved on the, the ship, getting ready for, for the deployment. Here's the, those glass balls for the flotation, the acoustic release. And then you can see down on the bottom here, just, just barely um, the, um, uh, the, the weight that will be dropped if we wanted to recover it. Um, after the system was deployed, we, uh, we weren't able to bring the cable all the way ashore. So uh, Ian and Zarandi worked here on the ship to take the end of the cable to uh, splice into the, the fiber optics so we could apply, um, so we could have the signal available. And then we applied power to the, um, to the cable from the ship. And we were able to, um, to, to talk to the link at the other end of the cable. And we could, could see that the, the remote system, which was transmitting its data back acoustically regularly, was functional. So we, we did this proof of concept, uh, showed that we were, we were able to transmit real time data from the pressure sensor. Uh, here we're seeing actually the, the tidal signal, the, the tidal change, the tide changes the pressure. So the, um, the depth uh, sh uh, shows a, a small change. Uh, it's about uh, 1,720 meters deep. And then as the tide changes, the signal changes a, a little bit. Um, unfortunately, uh, at this point in time, there was there was uh, no way to bring the cable ashore, and so um, we um, had to continue our work. And there were a number of, of other um, uh, different adventures that we that we did along along the way with new cables, and all of that is detailed in uh, another chapter in, in the book. I just thought it would um, show some additional pictures of how we went back. Um, 
and recovered the system. So we went back in, in 2022, um, two years after the initial deployment to recover the system, to uh, check that um, it was still functional and also to change the, the batteries and to, to clean it up. So we, uh, we chartered a, a local ship um, and this is the, uh, the vessel here um, that we were able to, able to use. Um, local, local folks who had never done this before, uh, but they were able to configure uh, their ship with a, a couple of clever um, rigging setups and uh, able to re recover, recover the, um, the, the system and bring it back bring it back on board. Here we are uh, raising it back out of the uh, of the, the, the water. This is a, a picture where you can see those, those glass balls for the flotation again. And then um, if we if we look back back here, uh, this is actually the, the pressure, the, uh, the, the, the processor with the battery is all here in this uh, titanium pressure housing. And this is all uh, just a standalone, a standalone unit. So we brought this uh, back on board. We're very pleased to be able to um, to do this with this small ship. The the, the team was uh, uh, really excited to be able to to go out and uh, and do this with a ship that had never been never been configured or used for something such as this before. And then we uh, we brought back the system uh, to, to Padang. We brought it back to the University of Andalus where. Um, we were able to use a, a laboratory to be able to clean everything up and uh, change the, uh, the batteries. Um, the system was, was quite corroded, um, but we were able to clean up the corrosion. Um, the, the titanium pressure housings uh, looked, uh, looked great. So we opened these up and we changed the uh, batteries. We use a, a lithium ion batteries, which, which last for roughly, roughly two years. And then uh, we went out to sea again on a, a beautiful day. Um, the ship was loaded up with cargo. The, the entire hold actually was filled up with cargo to go out to uh, to, to Um And so we actually um, had to put our equipment on board, but this was a, a dual use crew. So able to take advantage of the fact that the ship was already scheduled to uh, to go out to the island and was basically going right over the top of the, the area where um, we have, we wanted the sensor to, to go back into. And then we, <coughs> redeployed it. Um, this is just a picture of it. It's all cleaned up now with the, with the change of batteries here. You're back on, on, board, the, on board the ship. Um, we're actually uh, on a pile of steel that was going out for a building site on, on Sibrut. And I don't have a picture of the actual deployment, but uh, we successfully put the units over the side. Um, we had fresh weights on the, the bottom of the lander. We dropped it back to the, the, the bottom of the ocean and uh, it's, there, it's there now. And uh, um, we probably will go back sometime this year to uh, recover it. And then we'll bring it back on shore, back up to the University of Andalus, and then where we'll uh, await um, another opportunity to, to put it, it back in and connect it up to a cable system. Um, or perhaps um, we'll, we'll, we'll select a different lo location. There's lots of different uh, potential places in Indonesia where a system such as this could, could, be, could be used. They all require these, these uh, short lengths of cables, uh, five to 10 kilometers. And uh, we'll continue to, to work with our, our partners in Indonesia to see whether there will be future opportunities um, there, perhaps in the Matawi, perhaps even uh, offshore of, of, uh, of Bali or some of the other other islands where, where there's the potential for a near shore a near shore tsunami. Further, this isn't the only place where this type of system um, might be useful, and so there's other places around the world, and we're also we'll also continue to look for applications where, uh, again, we don't have to have uh, only a cabled system, but we can utilize uh, our hybrid approach, which which is to take advantage of acoustic propagation in temperate climates, and then shore cables, which again offer the advantage of being a lot less expensive, uh, technologically simpler, and also easier to uh, to deploy and re recover. So um, thank you very much for, for listening in, in, in today. And uh, here's the, the link for the, the, the book and the, the code for it. And uh, there's uh, this story and a whole lot more in the, in the book. I'll, I'll summarize there in a, in a, a nice form that uh, Louise and Hakunti um, uh, were able to, uh, to get us to, uh, to, to, to do as engineers. We, we don't normally write in this, in this format, but it was, uh, it was great to be able to, to lay out the whole, the whole picture mm -hmm. and uh, present it in, in, one, in one location. So thank you, Louise and Arkunti for your efforts there and to Ireland Press for doing the, the publication. And we'll, we'll stop here and, and set up to take questions. Hey, thank you so much, Lee. And thank you very much, Louise. Um, mm -hmm.
we uh, I just wanted to let everyone know you can go ahead and send in questions. You can put questions for the presenters into the, the question panel of the user interface. You can also put um, questions and comments in the chat function, and you are able to, to share those with everyone if, if you think it's something that would benefit from the input of the other attendees, too. Um, question, I was wondering if there's any plans to expand um, the system that uh, Lee was talking about to any other areas right now. Well, this is an international project. Um, since the system would operate in Indonesian waters, it was really critical to have the support and the cooperation and collaboration from the Indonesian national agencies. This, however, is a policy problem. And it does require the Indonesian government to support uh, <clears throat> such a proposal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right now, there is a national election undergoing in Indonesia, I believe next month, February 24th. And uh, right now, things our Indonesian colleagues have told us that as in our country too, things wait until after the election and the officials are in place. So we are in touch with our Indonesian colleagues. They are eager to do it, but they need to have, and this is the policy approach, right? They need to have the support and the funding from their uh, own national public agencies. We would love to do it in other locations. There are other tsunami basins, one of which is the Caribbean in, uh, you know, between North and South America, which would be another potential location, uh, possibly also along the coast of uh, South America. Ecuador has a considerable uh, risk for tsunamis, Australia, New Zealand also. Okay, thank you, Louise. I wish, um, I, I, I wish I could say next month in six months, we'll do it again, but it's a complicated process and we need to build that support for it. Okay. Thank you, Louise. <clears throat> um, we now have several questions. We'll start with one. Um, is it correct that the oceanic conditions required for this system to function are not present in all environments? I'm yes. That. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is that, that's definitely true. If we were to have this kind of system in in a northern climate where where there is not a warm water layer present throughout the year, that the, then the sound would uh, hit the surface and it would simply re reflect. And in, in that reflection, that there would be a lot of, of loss, so it would not be as uh, as efficient. So 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 indeed, um, it's, it's not possible to use this approach everywhere because you don't ha always have the sound re refracting uh, near the near the surface. I will say, however, is that. Uh, the tsunamis occur maybe most frequently around the ring of fire. And that is, um, and there are lots of countries and lots of people in those equatorial zones. Um, great, thank you very much, Lee and Louise. Um, let's see, lots of good questions. Um, is there a way to test the entire system without an actual earthquake and tsunami? If so, has this been done and what were the results? Lee, <laughs> that was 2016, right? Yeah, so we haven't done a full test live. Uh, we're close, but not quite. So, so what we have was a six month six month record from the same area um, that that was collected with the with the uh, pressure sensor, and then I gave that to Emil Okal, who then looked at the earthquake signals that were on there. This goes back to um, Mike An Mike Ango's question. Hi, Mike. I think we we met before or talked on the phone. Um, I'll send you the link to Emil's paper where where he he used that data. Um, to be able to to compute the, um, the, um, the the magnitude of the earthquakes and also compare it against the measurements which were, were made for, from seismometers on shore. So that's that's a good question. And, and there's a nice paper that Emil wrote which describes some of that. Um, 
should I just go on to answer some of these other other questions kind of, of in line? We, we, we looked at, at uh, the question sure. from Joshua sure. Blockstein. Uh, so uh, yeah, the question for, for, from Chris Ansel, um, is the detector system prone to false positives or, or negatives? Yes, yeah, so this, is, this is one of the, the, the real tough challenges of, of the system. Whenever the, the, the seafloor shakes just from an earthquake, the, the, um, the, the pressure sensor uh, r r r r r uh, response to that. And so differentiating between just an earthquake and between a, a pressure sensor in the near near field is really challenging. Uh, so we have, have looked at that to a certain extent. I'm not going to say that it's, it's, it's a problem. And the approach that we used um, built on work that, that a number of other researchers have done, including those in Japan, where you, you filter the um, the signal uh, so as to try to, to remove the high frequency components, which are, are, from, are from the earthquake nearby, and then the low frequency, would which is the, the, the pressure waves. This is um, not, my, not my area of expertise, but we worked with a number of people um, who, who helped us in trying to do the, this differentiation. And uh, like I said, it's not a solved problem, but we are we have some data that we worked with and we have looked at that. I will, if I may, I will add that uh, detecting false positives and negatives has been a major issue for the other methods of used for tsunami detection. And I will just refer to the 2018 uh, tsunami that occurred in Sulawesi, where in fact, the Indonesian tsunami system relied on ground-based sensors to detect an earthquake. But since the earthquake occurred outside the range of the ground-based sensors, it did not pick up the sensors. So when it initially occurred, they picked up an earthquake had occurred, but when, since it was outside their range, the um, agency re, uh, recalled the warning. So they canceled the tsunami warning and minutes later, the tsunami wave came in and killed over 4,000 people and literally created tremendous damage because people thought they were safe and were out in the street again. And so this is a major issue for all tsunami systems. And one of the reasons that this system is, we believe, I think Lee is a bit modest, that it gives a much more accurate profile of movement underwater that verifies a tsunami. Is that right, Lee? I hope <laughs> the closer. Well, I think there are people on on the uh, this webinar who, who know more about this than, than I do, to be honest. But uh, the closer you can get to the source, the, the, the potentially the better the source of information. Uh, and then here's a question from Felicia and briefly explain how the population will be warned of an upcoming tsunami. This is the social science component. And I didn't go into it uh, in detail. Uh, after the 2004 tsunami, Indonesia developed a tsunami warning system, and uh, it's a very complex, detailed system that includes a knowledge base, a GIS system, a mapping system, and communications, policies of communications between the national agencies, the provincial agencies, the um, municipalities, and the neighborhoods. The weakness in that system has been the link at the local level. It's the last mile link where in small cities, the communication doesn't get out to the neighborhoods. So the people in the neighborhoods, you know, this earthquake has occurred. They may have felt the shaking. If they don't know it's a tsunami, they don't know when to go or where to go. And this is literally why of so many people died in the 2004 tsunami. So our project was specifically designed to address this problem of creating neighborhood networks. And here, working with computer scientists at the University of Pittsburgh, they designed a network using these single board computers that you could fasten literally on uh, telephone poles and they would connect directly to the Iridium satellite because and create essentially a hotspot 
over the neighborhood. So people using smartphones can communicate with one another. The local provincial agency can communicate to the neighborhood and the neighborhood leaders can guide them to safe shelter. Um, and we tested this in Padang. This is another instance where the communications works, the design works, but connecting it to the whole system, the undersea system was what was honestly disrupted by the um, tsunami. So that we got a design for. And I will say this is something that Harkuti uh, Rahayo, my colleague in our colleague in Indonesia, worked on very uh, carefully. She has done a lot of of uh, public education with communities that are subject to tsunamis to uh, enable them and help them develop their neighborhood networks where the people in the neighborhood elect their own leaders and the leaders take responsibility for communicating with every single household in that neighborhood. Okay, thank you, Louise. Um, Lee, I just wanted to let you know, I reposted, um, you had posted something, but it only went to the hosted panelists. So I reposted it to everyone okay. so they could get that, that link. Um, there was another question that came in. Could you briefly explain how the population will be worn? Oh, sorry, that was the one we just did. Um, how would the intensity of a tsunami vary depending on whether it results from an earthquake or a volcanic eruption? Do these detective detection devices also work for detecting tsunamis from volcanic eruptions or just earthquake or or is it just earthquakes? So that's a good uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. So anything that, that results in the, the ground shaking is going to potentially create an event which would, would be triggered but by our very simple uh, detector. And so um, anything that, that's happening nearby, a subsea could be uh, detected. And a volcano has uh, has other signatures, including a uh, acoustic signature for, from from the uh, eruption, eruption itself. So we haven't, I hadn't considered um, putting these in proximity to underwater areas where underwater volcanoes could occur, but this, the same principles apply. When the, when the ground shakes, the, uh, the pressure sensor uh, has a signal and uh, the detector uh, that is looking at the data from the pressure sensor would register that and it would create an event which would then go, go back to shore. So the system would work, but we'd have to make sure that it could be tuned uh, so that um, uh, you, you understood what you were uh, what you were actually seeing. And it goes back to the filtering I was describing uh, about uh, getting rid of the high frequencies potentially to show that there's a pressure signal which is which is actually from a, a, a tsunami. I will add that this exact situation. Uh, occurred in December 2018 with a small tsunami, well, small, <laughs> it was a sizable tsunami that was generated by a landslide from the side of the Iraq volcano. Uh, and uh, it was not picked up by the undersea, uh, excuse me, by the ground network. And so that tsunami occurred as a total surprise to these communities. Uh, and actually on both sides of the Sunda Strait, communities were affected. Not as many people were uh, uh, killed, but it was still an example of how the existing tsunami detection systems did not pick up a tsunami that was caused by an undersea volcanic landslide. Okay, thank you so much, Louise, and thank you so much, Lee. Okay, a uh, question that came into the chat was, are there any estimates of what the wave amplitude accuracy might be? So again, this is an area that's a little bit outside of my primary expertise, which is acoustic acoustic communications. But the the strength of the pressure signal is is definitely uh, re related to the size of the wave. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, of numerical calculations that have to be done to to relate the size of the pressure signal to the actual run up uh, of a tsunami, which is the which is the the uh, uh, the the um, amount of, of ground it will cover when it, it comes on shore so that that sort of modeling is uh, is has been done and uh, it's outside of, of 
of what this project what was in, intended intended to do, but indeed the strength of the signal which we would detect and send back can be related to the, the run up of a particular of a particular tsunami. I'd like to respond to Maria Carrillo uh, as an anthropologist, also working on ca catastrophe hazards modeling. Uh, we are delighted to meet you and would very much uh, like to connect with you. So thank you for sharing your email. Okay, thank you, uh, Louise, and thank you, Maria. Um, we don't have any other questions right now. That we we have some some other comments from from Mike and um, some other participants. Um, I did uh, want, was wondering. We were only able to sort of really cover in depth um, just a few areas from the book. Um, were there any other um, topics that are covered in the book that you just wanted to highlight here right now? Well, I would like to highlight that we also did a lot of modeling for the uh, community-based networks. We were not at all certain that people would be willing to learn how to use a smartphone. The smartphones, the uh, single board computers would be a network of computers that would need to be fixed ahead of time. So people would need to either have them on their houses, put them on the telephone poles, put them in structures that would not collapse if there was an earthquake. This was one of the things that happened in Turkey where uh, the uh, cell phone signals were built on tops of houses that collapsed. And when the houses collapsed, of course, the system network would collapse. So selecting how and where to place these this network of single board computers would involve community participation, people who would need to agree to it. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, they're about $200 each. Um, so each neighborhood literally would need to have at least one, if not two. And so engaging the neighborhoods and people in reducing their own risk is really important, especially for these hazards that are you know, uh, years apart. In Indonesia, they occur, there's a major earthquake or tsunami at least once a year in Indonesia, but Indonesia has 18,000 islands, so they're not always in the same place. So building this sustainable sense of resilience and a and neighborhoods change and people change and positions change, it's a continuing effort. So this is why we wanted to connect with nonprofit organizations. And we did work with Kogami, which was a really excellent uh, nonprofit organizations there, but also with the local communities. And here is where uh, Febron uh, Ismail at Andalas University works with his students in Padan. And they have developed a design for uh, a tsunami shelter, which is really focusing on uh, taking the little neighborhood mosques and turning them, you know, year by year, step by step into a tsunami shelter for the neighborhood. Uh, because in, in Padang, 60% of the city is in what they call the red zone, which is it's under five feet and would likely be wiped out. So just in case people couldn't get to high down, if they had a tsunami shelter in their neighborhood, it would be important. And I will say that's chapter five in the book with Febron uh, Ismail and his students. What I like very much about all of the chapters in the book is that graduate students were involved in this research and I think at least three got their dissertations um, published from this book. Fantastic, thank you, Louise. Um, we did have another question come in. Uh, is there an ROM, I'm not getting the abbreviation right now, is there an ROM figure for the cost of building and deploying and powering the cable to the receive point? Yes. Yeah, so that, that that's Mike uh, asking about the, uh, 
the rough order magnitude cost. I just responded to uh, to him directly. Um, so one of the really interesting things that we found, uh, Mike, was that the cost of, of building these cables in Indonesia was maybe a factor of 10 less. The, 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 we believe they're produced under license as a local manufacturer. And also uh, the VPPT was able to able to so source the, the cable end terminations as well. And then they built up the, the power supplies, uh, which, which didn't have to use extreme voltages, only a few hundred volts, be able to build them up themselves. So it was really lit literally some tens of thousands of dollars to build some of those those components. Whereas in in if you were, were to procure those components from from Europe or from the U.S., it would be literally ten times more. So that the homegrown system um, is uh, is very reasonable, um, although um, not replicable, you know, here in the in the U.S. At, at the at those same prices. That was one of I think the, the key things that we came away with is that is that uh, an economy um, such as Indonesia's, which which has lower costs for, for manufacturing, but access to to relatively high technology via licensing. And also because in Indonesia they need lots of, of, of undersea cable, so they have a large volume pr production. It's kind of an ideal setup uh, for, for being able to uh, to do something like this, uh, short cables or long cables as well. So um, maybe that's, that's a chapter that we missed, Louise, which was some of the economic uh, differences be between implementing these systems uh, in uh, Europe or the U.S. Or versus uh, versus Indonesia, and uh, some of the advantages of the, these systems, which were, were were manufactured essentially entirely. In Indonesia, except for the acoustic modems, which we brought from the United States. Well, I think that's true. And Lee, I also want to highlight the contributions, significant contributions of the six universities that were involved. I know the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm very grateful for the support that they gave. Also, Bandung Institute of Technology, also your own institution. And this was with administrative support, graduate students, uh, travel, uh, all of which was really very important. And I will say was initiated by the International, uh, the uh, National Science Foundation grant. And then when Swiss Re stepped in to support it, we were truly grateful. And uh, also the small foundations in Indonesia as well. So it just, emphasize, I just want to emphasize again, these are interdisciplinary, interorganizational, interjurisdictional, international projects. But it's worth doing if we look at the risk and the potential for reducing that risk and saving lives, it's a major step forward. And we were grateful and pleased to have the opportunity to do this but we would very much like to see it continue. Great, thank you, Louise. Um, and Mike also commented that maybe this approach would, could also work for small island developing states like New Caledonia and Tonga, et cetera. Absolutely, um, absolutely. One more question, like what sort of, uh, how close together would you want the offshore systems in an ideal world? Um, like how, how many of these do you need sort of for full, for full, full coverage for the areas they're able to monitor? So uh, I think in these relatively small areas, um, distances of maybe 30 kilometers or so, I, I think uh, with some other seismologists I've talked to, we, we threw around numbers of 60 kilometers apart, um, just because you have some coherence, uh, some local coherence, but that, that's, that's the rough, rough scale. Wouldn't be any reason to have them more than sort of 20 to 60 kilometers. And uh, again, other folks who who are experts in, in, in propagation uh, rather than communication like, like myself could, could also uh, provide some input on that. But one of the other uh, possibilities that we had considered was the key area we wanted to protect with this project was the city of Padang, which is a city of about a million people. And it's probably the largest and most significant port in Western Sumatra. So having the port go down in Padang would be really serious and the damage to the people. So the real question is, could we use several linkages, sort of multi-hops, and create a network of these networks to protect the city of Padang? And uh, this certainly was one of the ideas that was developed, in, I think, in our conceptual model. Um, and it would require, you know, design, implementation, 
but I think it could be done and um, we could certainly explore that further. Okay. Thank you, Louise. Um, <laughs> one more uh, question. I'll let you guys follow up with Mike uh, offline. Okay. Um, but thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for doing this work in the first place. Um, but thank you so much for being here today and telling us about it. And we um, would encourage you to get in touch with the presenters. You can contact me offline uh, for, for email addresses um, for collaborations. And um, thank you everyone who was able to attend today. And we hope to see um, this fully fleshed out and uh, not have... it, not theoretically, but in practice to see it out there in the future. I have one last thank you, a very warm thank you to Erin Johnson, who is the editor of this book from Island Press. She was marvelous through all of the stages and I really appreciate it. And a great shout out to Erin and Island Press. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you. Thank you guys again for presenting uh, Louise and Lee. And thank you to everyone who attended. And we um, hope to see you on future webinars. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.